So, Steve, ask me this, man, okay? Because this is something I've been wanting to ask you for a while, okay? I remember hearing you on stage somewhere. And when I say on stage somewhere, I mean on a YouTube video because we've never actually been on the same continent. Never mind, met each other in person. Put that aside. Yeah, let's, <laughs> we, we, don't need, we don't need a head explode moment right at the outset here. But yes, that is true. Somehow that is true. It's it's not going to be true at some point in the near future, hopefully. Exactly. But, We're working yeah. on it. We're working on it. Yeah. But I've heard you say this thing, okay? You've described light as a drug. Yeah, man. What is going on there? Like, that's like a clickbait title. So, like, fill me in on that. Yeah, that's one of my, my favorite little coinages. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> light is literally a drug. So, light, as folks probably have heard, is both a wave and a particle. Don't think about it too much right now. But the duality paradox of light. But it comes to us in little particles called photons. And they literally travel through the eye to the tissue on the back of the eye, which is, believe it or not, an outpost of brain tissue. So if you if you wanted to map out like where's the brain, the furthest outpost of the brain is the back of the eye. We call it the retina. And it's literally made just like the rest of brain tissue, except it's in the back of our eyeball. And so, so like a re the retina, like if you took my eyeball away, the thing that's left, it's basically part of my brain rather than part of my eye. Or am I just like opening up like <laughs> something that professors argue about endlessly? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it, okay. So neuroscientists would say that if somebody's eyeball is removed, wow, this is really taking a dark turn right at the outset. No, <laughs> no pun intended. Dark turn, eyeball, I don't know. All right. If, <laughs> if somebody, I, yeah, oh, it's, it's like... Dad jokes just roll out <laughs> unintentionally. The back of the eyeball is, if you talk to a neuroscientist, they'd say that looks just like brain tissue, the retina. And so neuroscientists would say that the optic nerve, which travels from what we classically think of as the brain to the back of the eye, that the optic nerve ends in the retina. And the whole thing is really technically to a neuroscientist still part of brain tissue. So what's the point? When those little packets of light hit the back of the eye, they're really hitting the brain and they are lodging into specialized receptors. So when we think of a brain chemical like dopamine or serotonin, we think, well, if we know anything at all about neuroscience, we know that serotonin has specialized receptors between brain cells. They're called serotonin receptors with dopamine. We've talked about D2 receptors for dopamine and so forth. Well, there are photon receptors. Photon is like a drug like a neurochemical that hits these specialized receptors in the back of the eye and they are not the rods and the cones that we learned about maybe back in school that give us color vision and give us black and white vision these are basically just picking up the luminance the intensity of light and they signal with this broadband connection back to the center of the brain where the body clock is for people keeping score at home it's called the suprachiasmic nucleus and it, <laughs> that made you smile. <laughs> it, it, yeah, um, I was gonna, you know, I'm just not even gonna say yeah, anything because I, I just love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the point? The amount of light that is hitting our retina in the back of the eye literally is determining what's going on in our body clock. And the body clock, of course, evolved and was adapted to the life of our ancestors where they're on this lifelong camping trip. They're out in nature all the time and they're getting these phase shifts. They're getting these ebbs and flows of the drug of light throughout the day, which is doing all these incredible things to brain function, including the function of brain chemicals that we've talked about a lot, like dopamine and serotonin and others, but also just keeping that body clock in sync and we're going to unpack all of that later in the episode awesome so i remember reading your book the depression cure and reading kind of like you know all these thoughts on light and just being struck for like for the first time in my life like oh my goodness i've never once thought that light is something that could make a difference in my depression i remember when we did some of the other 101 episodes in the series like i think it was was it ADHD and, I mean, you can crack me in this, potentially even anxiety as well that light Absolutely. can do some like really cool things for Absolutely. us? Absolutely, yeah. And so light at high doses, the doses that our bodies and brains are designed to have, which means basically the kind of light that we get outside in nature, because it's, as we're going to talk about, it's far brighter outside than it is, even in the best lit indoor room. We're talking like 100x, 1000x 
brighter. Light at high doses can help dramatically many forms of depression, many forms of ADHD, some forms of anxiety. It definitely can help our insomnia. And, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, it, it's available for us if we could, I, I've said this before about exercise, but if we could, if we, if we could take the, the, <laughs> the psychoactive effects of light, package it in a pill, Photon Zach or something. I don't know. That I, I know. That, that's a very polite laugh. Thank you. Um, it it would be a really, really widely, it'd be a very profitable. Dude, we would make billions is what you're saying. Billions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, let's get to work on that. In the meantime, though, uh, because of, of our, I think, uh, altruistic sort of sensibility, our value that we both share, we want to give away all this information for free. We're not about monetizing stuff. We want to lift people up. We want to help people have knowledge that they can leverage and put to use in their life. So that, that's what we're about. We're going, to, we're going to unpack all this in just a bit. Absolutely. Cool. So, I mean, just to build on what Steve was saying, welcome to Mental Health. This is the show where we discuss the latest tools, ancient practices, and the cutting edge research to help you take back control of your emotional well-being. We are a podcast. We are now a YouTube channel. We have a website. We are building out the different content streams and we're having a blast doing so. We really appreciate you spending this time with us. And big shout out to all of our longtime listeners who've been with us over the last six months. Today, we are doing another episode as part of our Essential series where we'll be taking a look at some of the most important tools that you can have in your mental health toolkit. We've kind of been teasing this over the last few months when we've been diving into different mental health disorders. We've done depression 101, we did anxiety 101, we did ADHD 101, and we kind of got to the end of that. We were like, look, there's a lot of amazing content here, but there's some threads that run through all these episodes. There's some tools that we keep coming back to suggesting time and time again and light is one of them so we're going to take today to do a little bit of a deep dive it's a bit of a paradox but we'll say it anyway a little bit of a deep dive all into light therapy for various types of mental health disorders and how you can start implementing some of these practices in your daily life really even starting from tomorrow and getting the benefits off them so yeah look my name's Hugh James I'm a writer and I'm a podcaster from Ireland who's been in recovery from depression and addiction over the last 15 years and I'm joined by my wonderful co-pilot here today. Hey, yeah, hey everybody. I'm, I'm Steve Alardi, and I'm a psychologist. I'm a neuroscientist. I'm a professor. I'm a writer. I'm an oh, NBA analyst, consultant. I, I don't talk about that part too much. But we'll, we'll Something new for the LinkedIn bio? Yeah, Come on, guys. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it, it is NBA playoff season while we're recording this. By the time we drop it, it the playoffs may be over, but... Hey, more than anything else, I say this just about every time, I, I'm a fellow traveler with each of you on this journey to living our, our best possible lives, to this journey to well-being that is not a destination, it's, it's a process, right? The joy is in, in the journey itself, and we're all in this together, and it's our privilege to be part of that process with each of you. So let's do this thing. <laughs> bro i mean we're we haven't even hit the 10 minute mark yet and you've we've dropped in some philosophy we've dropped in some good neuroscience here i you know i'm excited absolutely so let's pick up where we left off okay talk to me about this idea of a body clock because i think a lot of us listening we've heard about a body clock we've heard about a circadian rhythm if we're super fancy and you know we kind of like roughly understand what it is it's like am i waking up before my alarm is like i think how most people gauge like is my body clock working but give us your take on that as someone who's spent you know your whole career researching and, and practicing this stuff with all of your your clients absolutely yeah so i'll be honest before i went to grad school when i would hear people talk about a body clock i kind of assumed that it was like a metaphor i, I didn't i didn't <laughs> I didn't think like, all right, well, it's not like we've got this Rolex somewhere lodged in our brain um, or anything analogous to that. I, I figured it was just, you know, some sort of intuition that people had. But, but no, it turns out like we literally have brain cells that run on a roughly 24 hour cycle. And they're an identified part of the brain called, I mentioned it earlier, suprachiasmic nucleus, if people want to look that up, SCN for short, and it's very near the center of the brain. It's in a very ancient part of the brain, right adjacent to maybe technically even a part of the hypothalamus in the center of the brain. And it has circuitry that's very clever, although not as clever as some species. Some species, they have a body clock that is like 
infallibly wired. You could set your watch by you it. Could. It's like those master clocks you... that ever all the clockmakers used to bring all of their clocks. Exactly. To. <laughs> there are some species that where it's it's just about flawless twenty four hour cycle. Ours, Do you have an example on hand? I just some dying. There, in I know there are some fish species that are like cave dwelling that don't have access to what we call zeitgeibers or environmental contextual cues of lightness and darkness or other circadian shifts. And humans, of course, again, back to the ancestral environment, our ancestors were outside all the time. And so here's the deal. They did not need a Rolex for a body clock. Why? Because as long as it could be sort of ballparkish, like, what do I mean by, well, it turns out if you put humans in a cave, and this study has been done many times, if you give people a setting where they cannot see natural ebbs and flows of light and dark. So they're like in some underground lab for a few weeks. This, you know, people have done this, they get paid. You'd have to pay me quite a, quite a bit probably <laughs> to, to, to volunteer for this experiment. But th the first question that uh, researchers had was like, what would happen to the body clock if you just let people wake up whenever they want, go to bed whenever they want, when they go to bed, like pitch dark, blackout until they wake up naturally and then lights come on. And what they found is most people's body clocks will start drifting by an hour or two every day. So that, oh my yeah, like at the end of a week underground in this artificial setup, people, Your vampire mode. Pe yeah, people are off by like, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours. Crazy. And yeah, this would have never happened to our ancestors. Unfortunately, it does happen, not quite so dramatically, but a milder version of that for many, many people who are living their lives indoors where, and I mentioned this at the, at the top of the episode, but indoor lighting, because our eyes are so beautifully designed to function in any light conditions, I mean, it, like an extraordinarily expensive camera with auto adjust for lighting, you know, if you've got a really amazing camera, there's a chance that you could take it outside on a bright sunny day where it's like literally we measure light intensity in units called lux, L-U-X, and it could be 100,000 lux outside, sunny, midday, and then you walk inside in a dimly lit room and it's 50 lux. So we're talking about now a difference of 2000 X. And if it's a really, really great camera with a good light sensor, it can adapt and you can take a photo in any lighting. Well, that's what our eye does. And so we don't really notice that it is so much dimmer inside because it feels reasonably comfortable. Kind of like a way to flip that on its head is like people will, if anyone was born in the 90s or before, like you'll, you'll definitely appreciate this. Like if you took any old technology outside on a sunny day, I'm talking like an old mobile oh, yeah, phone there you go. or your, or yeah, your yeah. Game Boy or your laptop or whatever, you just you can't categorically yeah. could not see yeah. it because it was so, so light. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, even even earlier on, I, like, did a little bit of laptop work outside. And I was struggling because the sun was out. And I was like, man, like, you don't realize how, like, powerful or weak, I guess, your screen's backlight is until you put it up against something like the actual sun. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, so we get a sense of the contrast in both directions. And our eye is, again, so well designed that most of the time we function just fine, even if we live our lives indoors. Now, in the wintertime, lots of folks who are not in a very equatorial zone of the world, if they're, you're in Ireland, I'm in the center of the US, and in the wintertime, it gets dark really early. It, the sun doesn't come up in the morning until rather late. And so we have all these people that are basically waking up in the dark, they're going to work in the dark, they're leaving work and it's dark. They're indoors all day. And now their body clock is never getting reset. And what I, what I meant to mention before we took that little tangent is if you are in the ancestral environment and you're on this lifelong camping trip, then your body clock is getting reset every morning. Okay, that's the key. So if you're outdoors and you're waking up to the, whenever the sun comes up, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because changes in sunrise time are very gradual throughout the year. They, they change by about a minute, a minute a day, basically. You know, as the days are getting longer, sun's coming up a, a minute earlier every day and vice versa as the days get shorter. So our ancestors are basically like their body clock would on its own would want to drift by an hour or two, but it's never going to have a chance to drift because the body clock circuitry 
is very cleverly programmed. Here we go. Here's the programming. Basically, every morning when it goes from very dark to very bright, then you reset. You set the counter back to like this is the anchor point for all of your biorhythms that regulate your sleep, that regulate your hormones, that regulate your arousal, that regulate all of your 24 hour biorhythms, they're reset every single morning, huh? Like clockwork. And so, <laughs> and so um, our ancestors never had to worry about their body clocks getting getting way out of sync. But it's a very modern affliction. Basically, ever since Edison and colleagues came along and gave us the blessing and the curse of indoor lighting, increasingly we see people living their entire lives or almost their entire lives indoors. And ironically, even when people are outdoors commuting, they're often in vehicles that have very heavily tinted windows. So they're still not getting the benefit of outdoor lighting. So here's the point. I think I've been kind of obliquely alluding to it, but indoor lighting is not strong enough to reset the body clock. It's not bright enough. It's not a high enough dose of light to reset the body clock. And so for so many people, especially during the winter, but it can happen really any time of year. If they're living life indoors, they're not getting the benefit of this drug. It's affecting their body clock and then everything else goes out of whack, including the functioning of many important brain chemicals and the circuits that they use that regulate our, our attention, our anxiety level. We mentioned at the top of the show that light therapy, giving people who are light deprived, giving them access to adequate light, it can actually help symptoms of ADHD. It can actually help symptoms of anxiety. And most importantly, probably at least most notably, really powerful treatment for seasonal depression, winter onset depression, and surprisingly an effective treatment even for depression that doesn't have that seasonal component. Even people who get depressed in the spring, people who get depressed in the summer, people who get depressed in the fall, bright light therapy giving the eye this high dose of light has been shown to be to be really powerful and effective and the best part is it has therapeutic effects that can kick in often in like five to seven days and when we give somebody an antidepressant medication very often they're told you know it's going to be two to four weeks could be even a little bit longer before you start to see real noticeable effects with light therapy, when it's going to work, it very often kicks in very fast, which is beautiful. I'm looking for a light speed pun here, but it's not coming, so I'll just give it to you in, in, <laughs> oh, in, in rough light draft speed. form. I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There's a Coldplay song that talks about like traveling at the speed of light that I love. I think it's from a rush of blood to the head. But yeah, look, it, it was in my drafts there while you were talking, and I didn't have time to pause. Oh uh, no, it, it's it still it well, works. It's, it's it's interesting, like what you say, because you've kind of just laid out and helped me understand probably for the first time, like why people get sad. And I say sad as in like all caps, SAD, seasonal, seasonal affective yeah. disorder. And, you know, winter onset depression, I think is how you referred to it just a few seconds ago. And that, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, as you've alluded to, and as we talk about often, I'm from Ireland. And so like, we know all about like winter onset depression. Like we're currently in the summer glory days here where I have not seen it dark for about a month. It is just an endless summer where the sun goes down at like 11 o'clock. And when I wake up at six o'clock, it's already like as bright as it's going to get the rest of the day. So yeah, it's even funny from like a societal perspective. You just see our whole culture and our whole communities change so dramatically from say january to june like it is like it's like two different planets if aliens were observing us like <laughs> very very far away they would be like what is happening to these people why are they so so different and it's because you've just laid out it's all of these zeit gabriel yeah oh nice yeah. yeah yeah so you know my wife's german and so I can give you the direct translation for that. The time givers, that's basically what it oh, means. Giver lovely. is give, yeah. Zeit is time. And so all of these cues that Steve is talking about, you know, with the sun or with other types of bright light, they are the time givers. They're the thing that helps your body set its internal clock by, which I really love. So let's just get into it. What do we have to do? Indoor lighting is not enough. So if we were to prescribe light therapy to ourselves or to somebody that we love, obviously with consulting a doctor and all the usual disclaimer, what sort of intensity do we have to be aiming for here? Because I, I imagine that like, 
you know, turning the, the flashlight on on your phone and like turning it around into your eyeball first thing in the morning is not, not the not ideal a good way idea. to do that. No, <laughs> please don't try this at home, boys and girls. <laughs> so um, I, I mentioned earlier, light is measured in, in units called lux, L-U-X. And until 40, 50 years ago, nobody really knew what was the therapeutic dose of light. How many lux does it take? to have an antidepressant effect, to reset the body clock, to help with anxiety and so forth. And what's been discovered is the, the, the critical dose is about 10,000 lux, L-U-X. And that's about as bright as it is outdoors on a relatively clear day. It doesn't have to be cloudless, but you know, when the sun is actually shining and within 15 to, to 30 minutes of sunrise. Okay, at midday, it could be 100,000, 200,000 lux, depending on time of year. But 10,000 lux is the critical dose. Now, again, by way of comparison, typical indoor lighting is about 100 lux. So, you know, we're talking about 100x difference. A very, very bright indoor room could be 200 to 500 lux, but still nowhere near. Now, some people are, are going to be asking, well, okay, what if it's like a really gloomy, cloudy, gross day outside? By the way, some people don't find that gross, right? No judgment, but... I prefer sunny. Um, but if it's one of these really, really overcast days where the clouds are like a mile thick and it's just gray and gloomy and maybe rainy, then you're talking about... We call that October to May over here. <laughs> yeah. uh, dude, don't get me started on my, my first summer in England where, where I, I, lit I think I literally... We, we moved there in July. I regret that joke I made. I wish I had have said, that's us June to July I, every single year. <laughs> we moved, this is 1977. If somebody wants to look up the uh, historical archive, it was somewhere in July. And it's probably exaggerated in my, my head over time, but it felt like the first month we were there, I might've seen the sun a couple of times. And I'm like, this is July. It was a weird, well, it was a, the dark ages, bro. Was, yeah. We still live in the medieval times over here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, outdoors on a gloomy day, it's still about 1,500 lux or so. So in other words, you know, maybe 10 to 15 times brighter than it is indoors. It doesn't feel like it, but it really truly is. And it's still therapeutic. It just takes longer. So here's what's discovered. If you get 10,000 lux, then 15 minutes, first thing in the morning, and by that I mean you know, within an hour of waking up. Okay, I'll say that again. 15 minutes at 10,000 lux within an hour of waking up is perfectly fine for most people to keep their body clock in sync. Now, if they're depressed, clinically depressed, whether it's winter onset or any other seasonal pattern or non-seasonal pattern of depression, then the, the antidepressant dose of light is 30 minutes. 30 minutes, 10,000 lux. Ideally outside, but we don't always have that luxury. It could be, you know, the time of year when we can't do it. So, of course, there have been developed therapeutic light boxes. And if you look them up online, there are lots and lots of different vendors. And we're not here to necessarily tout any specific vendor. I don't have any financial interest in any of them. I will say the one that I, I have a couple. I have, we have a few uh, here that we lend them out to people. We give them out to people. Um, okay, okay, when you say you have a couple and then you say you have a few, <laughs> no. I had a very specific image in my yeah, head yeah. of you open a closet and there's like 50 different light boxes in there. Yeah, we, I think we have maybe 15 or so in, 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 my, in my lab. They technically belong to the university, but, but we've used them in different studies. The, the brand that, that I'm most fond of is Alaska Northern Lights. And I did oh, they're what just, a great brand. Yeah, there. and they're, I never heard of them, but yeah, I'm all, already I'm sold. <laughs> they they just make really really high quality products, and and the reason why I think this is important is if you go on a typical online purveyor of, of you know, like Amazon, uh, can I say yeah? I can say. It. <laughs> I was gonna say I think I, I do think Bezos would come after us for mentioning <laughs> his website. <laughs> if you go on Amazon and just type in light therapy or therapeutic light box, whatever, you will see, you'll be bombarded with now dozens, maybe hundreds of different products claiming to be 10,000 lux. But if you read the fine print, what you'll see is they'll put a little asterisk or something. And then the fine print will say at six inches from your eyeball, oh, like, you know, bro. or eight inches or 10 inches. And most of us really are not going to be able to tolerate being that close like you mentioned earlier like shining a uh, an iphone flashlight in your eye so 
What I would recommend is get a box that's bright enough that it will give you 10,000 lux from a comfortable distance. And I would say 16, 14, 16, 18 inches away, even 24 inches. Now you're gonna have to pay more technical note on, on the physics of optics and light for, for the reader. Oh, this is what the people want. Uh, absolutely. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, everybody's <laughs> tuning in for advanced <laughs> optics. It turns out that the luminance that we experience in our eye is directly proportional to the inverse of the square distance. So to translate that into English, if you take a light source and you double the distance or you make it twice as close, it is now four times as bright. Or if it's twice as far away, it's now four times as dim. So for something to be 10,000 lux at 24 inches, it would have to be four times brighter at the source than 10,000 lux at 12 inches. To make matters even a little bit more tricky, I have a lux meter. Yes, boys and girls, you can buy a lux meter online. They're not that expensive. I mean, you know, I don't know what, it's like 30 bucks or something. I just picture you every morning going outside with your morning cup of coffee. And a lux meter. Bringing the lux oh, meter dude, alongside I you, have done it. pointing it up I, at the sky I and be like, this. excellent, I'm at therapeutic level. <laughs> dude, I have checked the luminance at every window in our house at like, okay, well, what if I'm working at this window facing out, like at this distance? You know, there's a really interesting consultancy business here for you where you can like, you can add the therapeutic specs of, of a every office oh. or a home. And you know, it could be people who are mental health savvy, it's like, they're like, oh no, I will purchase this home because the luminosity is much greater at this window. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, we can cut in a skylight right here. <laughs> and at two in the afternoon, it's gonna be freaking amazing. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Oh, it turns out that a lot of light boxes do not deliver what they claim to deliver. You know, probably not terribly surprising. The more reputable, often a little bit more expensive boxes tend to deliver what they claim to deliver. In other words, 10,000 lux at 18 inches, whatever. Bottom line, you often get what you pay for. If somebody's on a budget, there are some reasonably inexpensive brand. And what I mean by that is you might have to invest about $100 or so to get a box that will actually deliver the goods. There's one, I mentioned it in my book, vendor at the time was called Uplift and they were bought out by another company. They're called Carex now. And if you go on Amazon and I believe even in the UK, even in Europe, much of Europe, you can get that for about a hundred dollars or so. And that's not a bad option. So I just wanted to put it out there for folks. It is an investment in the US, about half of insurance companies will reimburse for the purchase of a light box with a, with a clinician's recommendation, basically prescribing light therapy, which they will do typically, if there's any sort of seasonality component to depression. So that's the skinny on light boxes. There are a few, a few disclaimers, a few maybe additional details that we'd want to talk about. You and I talked about this uh, earlier, and I know you've got a prompt for, you want to ask about side effects? You? <laughs> Steve. Well, that was really What smooth. about side effects? <laughs> we are trained professionals here at the Mental Health Pod. So, Dr. Alardi, <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, as you were speaking, I really, really wanted to know, are there any potential side effects or any words of caution that you would give us before we wrap up this show about light therapy? Thank you so much for that question. Actually, before I get to it, <laughs> before I get to it, I did want to say one last thing. Our eyes have evolved to receive bright light coming from above, right? Because for our ancestors, Ooh, the sun was always coming good from, catch. Come yeah. from above. It has been discovered that the photoreceptors in the eye are maximally responsive to light that's coming at about a 30 to 45 degree angle from above. So when you get your light box, if it has a stand, which I would recommend, a lot of them, the better ones are sold with a stand that you can set it up and angle it. So with your breakfast, with your morning coffee, or if you want to set it up in your bathroom while, while you're doing your hair and your makeup, whatever, you, <laughs> I know you, you spent a lot of time on this, um, ideally would want to angle it so it's coming down, coming down at you from, you know, I don't know if folks know what a 30 or 45 degree angle is, but it's... Well, you know. I, I like this because I think so much of what we talk about on this show is how do we 
mimic our hunter gatherer ancestors as much as possible and so this is how do you make it as much like the sun as possible if the sun is not available to you at the time when you need it exactly right yeah thank you so if you happen to be in a setting where it's already sunrise within an hour of getting up then and and it's a nice day out by all means it's always better to do these things natural it's always better to just sit outside and read the paper or, or just Meditate. Meditate with your eyes open, though. Um, <laughs> uh, a little bit of light does pass through your eyelids for sure, but not not. I enough. mean, I imagine there, there's a there's a crazy good squared root formula for you know the luminosity that doesn't travel through your, through your eyelids. eyelids. Yeah. So let's just keep our eyes exactly. Open. <laughs> yeah, there there is a formula for that. Um, okay, so you're set up. You got the ten thousand lux coming from above. You start within an hour of, of wake up. And now the question is, well, are you going to see any side effects? How about this? Every drug, if it works on the brain, it has potential side effects. If it works on the body, it has potential side effects. Light is a drug. Does it have side effects? Absolutely. The most common by far for people who start light therapy is a little bit of eye, eye strain, possibly a l mild headache. That usually goes away within a day or two. It usually doesn't last very long. But that experience of while I'm using the light box, having some eye strain headache while I'm using it, usually we adjust to that within a couple of days. The Again, probably a little similar to like if you were sitting somewhere and the sun was like, you know, shining in your eyes. You can't got that kind of like, ah, they go away. Like you want to swat it away a little bit. You're yeah. like, you're irritating me. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah. I guess the other disclaimer we should put out there is you never want to look directly into the light box. It's just not not a great... I mean, we don't have any evidence that that's damaging to the eye. There, by the way, just really quickly, there are some light boxes out there that are blue spectrum shifted. And you'll sometimes see a light box labeled as for seasonal depression, for winter onset depression, blue light shifted or blue spectrum shifted. Why? Because our photoreceptors are particularly tuned to blue wavelengths. Why? Because natural light that gets filtered through the atmosphere is when we look at this. This is why people recommend don't, you don't look at screens before you go to exactly. bed. Or that you okay, then good. use the app that pushes the light coming off your screen in the red uh, yeah, zone. That it'll kind of like yellowy tint that it, it has a on yellow your, orange kind of yeah the be filter because the blue has been now filtered out and it's way less likely to keep you awake. Why? Because it doesn't take a lot of it doesn't take a big dose. It doesn't take a, a it doesn't take ten thousand lux of blue light. You can use a blue light box at five hundred lux. And it will do everything we've been talking about. So the viewer or the listener might be like, well, why the hell don't we just, just use blue light boxes? The answer is because it can damage your eye. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. honestly, up, like as soon as you said that part of me, was just like, my goodness, why have we even said everything that we've said? No, I yeah, <laughs> because there, there's growing evidence that it may be potentially dangerous to only give blue light to the eye. That's something that our ancestors never experienced. Yes, there was more blue. It was blue shifted, but it wasn't just pure blue light. And I could be wrong here, but I think my new glasses have a blue filter block or something on them. It's specifically to do with screens so i don't know if that means anything yeah well and it's so that could be helpful if you're using screens at night in particular so in fact this is a really deep cut but i'm going to go ahead and give it when we do bipolar 101 we're going to talk about when people go into a very dangerous state called mania where the brain is almost like in a seizure and it's on full tilt and the person has all kinds of energy but no judgment and they're they're often really dysregulated they stop sleeping it's a very it sounds to some people like oh that might be appealing the energy part for sure but it's a lot of people wind up in the hospital they wind up doing really really destructive things so it turns out that an innovative experimental treatment for mania is to have people wear wrap around amber tinted lenses goggles that filter out all the blue light all the time, if they're willing to do it for every moment that they're awake. And there have been some really promising, very small sample size studies, but super promising 
results for many people because it's sometimes really difficult to snap somebody out of a manic episode. That is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So also, mm-hmm. it's it's a great like learning example because it kind of shows the, power. the other side of what of what we're talking exactly. about today. You know, the power exactly. Yeah, right. and so that leads to another caveat, which is what if somebody has bipolar depression? People with bipolar are exquisitely sensitive to changes in light more than the average person. And so it turns out that our brains are the most sensitive to bright light first thing in the morning. That makes sense because of the way the brain wired itself up for the ancestral environment. But people with bipolar are so sensitive to light that we probably don't want them getting, it turns out, getting that much, that big a dose. And so the safer play, based on the research that I've seen, is for somebody with bipolar depression to get their bright light at midday, closer to noon or one in the afternoon. And again, always... Just because they're they're less sensitive to it. Yeah. The brain is less sensitive to bright light at that time. It still has a nice effect. And in bipolar depression, the person is often really shut down, very vegetative and just sluggish. And, and so... We want to give them the benefit of that dose of light, but in a way that's that's safer for them. And so this should only, only, only ever be done under medical supervision for any condition, but certainly for bipolar because the, the stakes are so high, the, the dangers are so real. Now, for most of us, the side effects that we would get if we don't have bipolar, again, we mentioned you know, headache, we mentioned eye strain. The big one though, that I haven't mentioned yet, is jitteriness. And there's a subset of the population, depending on the study, you read maybe 5% or so of people that get just really jittery, anxious, angsty, agitated. I would definitely listen to that. If you feel that within five or 10 minutes of using a light box, take it seriously. And then you could do one of two things. The safest thing would be to contact your healthcare provider. But many of my patients have talk to me about this. And I've just said, look, if you get that, then just double the distance. Double. So now you're basically cutting the dose by a factor of four, right? Because twice as far away, four times as dim. Double the distance. You're getting a much, much, much smaller dose at that point. See how that feels. And then you can slowly get closer and closer and closer in the ensuing days to sort of gradually let your brain adjust to that. So there, there are lots of of hacks and ways around this. The final thing I'd say is if you are the sort of person who is waking up way, way, way too early, and this is going back to one of the Q&A episodes that we did. Oh, yeah, yeah. We actually, we did a deep dive on this on something like phasal shifting, like how to shift your body clock. Yes, phase shifting, circadian shifting of the body clock. And we, so we can use our light box or we can actually use natural light as well. I'm, I'm gesturing to my left, which is, which is outside here as I'm recording this. If you are waking up way too early, then you want to shift your body clock basically a bit later. And the way you do that is to get your bright light later. So then if you're waking up way too early, you probably don't want to get your bright light first thing in the morning because that's basically just reinforcing and entrenching that phase shift early. So instead, you'd actually want to get your bright light about four hours before your target bedtime. So there is a sub... Um, We'll definitely put a link to the full episode where we take the deep dive on that. Uh, Wherever you're listening, you can kind of look, whether it's on Spotify or on YouTube, you can uh, get the link to that. That was a really interesting Q&A episode that we did, actually. That was a a lovely question that that she said. Yeah, so we we can use a light box. And by the way, there are these travel light boxes that are LED panels. So they're very light and very portable, like a flat screen LED. And they can still put up, because they're LED, they can put out 10,000 lux at a reasonable distance, just even this little tiny panel. They can be used for a very quick reset for jet lag as well. So, you know, next time I come to Ireland and pay (laughs) you a visit, we're talking about a six or seven hour time shift for me. So, what I'm gonna to wanna to do then is that first morning that I wake up in Ireland and it's, well, let's just say, you're gonna let me sleep in until seven, which would be- Generous? Yeah, <laughs> two in the morning for my body clock. My body clock is gonna be like, what the hell, dude? And I'm gonna be like- I'll be like, Steve, come work out, come work out. Do you wanna shoot hoops? Do you wanna shoot some hoops? Yeah, I can't wait really to show you my free throws, bro. And you'd be like, oh. No, no, because I'm gonna be talking 
directly to my brain with my little portable oh, light box. Yeah. And my brain is going to be like, wait, what? And it's going to be like, <laughs> oh, okay, I guess, I guess, you know, it's... it's Set the clocks, boys. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... By the way, one last thing. I know I'm just kind of free associate. I told, I warned you, I, ladies and gentlemen, just <laughs> if you're wondering why, why is Steve even just a little more scattered today? A little more. I need a bell. I really need like a bingo bell for whenever we say things like one last thing. Oh, no. dude. Why is Steve just a little bit more scattered than usual today? Because I have just turned in my final grades for the semester. I have 300 students. He's working on his undergraduate degree. We're, we're praying for him. I, I know. I'm on the other side of that equation now, my friend. I'm a little depleted. I'm a little, you know, I love my job. I, I, I will never complain because I, I'm so, so fortunate. I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed to, to do work that's so enjoyable, so meaningful. But I'm a little bit fried this morning. I'm not going to lie. So I, I may not be quite as tight. <laughs> Uh, with the content, but but hopefully still uh, lot lots that's that's valuable. Hugh's kind of nodding along. Bro, like, I uh, told you, I told you before. You know, you know, I work in radio. You know, on uh, with the weekly production schedule, it's like there's going to be times where you're fried and you show up. There's going to be times where you know you're literally shooting out lightning, uh, electricity's flowing from your fingertips. Well, uh, it's it's great. It's a good episode. Thank you. I'm enjoying thank it. Thank you. Well. Yeah. Well, I'm enjoying it too. The one tell for me, and I've told this to my graduate students that are my teaching assistants, because they've, they've asked me before when they know that I'm completely fried, sleep deprived. And they're like, you still seem like you got plenty of energy. You still seem fine. And I'm like, well, there's a tell. And the tell is that it just takes me way longer to get through the content. Because when I'm depleted it's like sort of a bumblebee that just kind of wants to light it's like oh there's a fire it's like <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's going to be the the sound effect i use to like whenever i'm like all right steve let's let's start to land the plane here i'm going to put a little bzzz. yeah it, yeah every time i'm like hey you one one last thing hey what hey man one last thing okay so here we go one last thing i gave a talk recently and i, I had this slide you could have to imagine powerpoint Except done really, I think this was done pretty well. It was this image, this is your brain on winter. And, and it's this, this, you know, cut out of a brain, except it's this wintry landscape. And the graphics were not, not bad. And then there was, the, you know, all the bullet points of like, well, what happens to your brain on winter? Well, why winter? Because that's when we're light deficient the most. That's when we have this seasonal onset pattern for mo most people that are going to have it, they get depressed in the winter. Now, a lot of people get depressed any time of year, but for about a quarter to a third of people, their depression is very predictably seasonal. All right. So what happens to the average person during winter when they're light deprived? They, well, what do we see? Reliably, people report, a subset of the population, up to half the population report, their mood is lower, their energy is lower, their melatonin levels go up. Now, wait a minute. Melatonin goes up. Why? Because melatonin is a hormone that is a darkness hormone, basically. So when you get your bright light reset in the morning, you know what it does to melatonin? It suppresses it dramatically. And so how does your brain know that your body clock is getting reset? You get the bright light that suppresses your circulating melatonin. Well, what does melatonin do in the, in the body and brain? Melatonin makes you drowsy. Melatonin sets the stage for sleep. And so when you get that burst of bright light in the morning, then melatonin disappears and you feel more alert, more awake, more aroused. What else does melatonin do? Well, it can increase your appetite. And people, many people, at least half the population, gain a bit of weight. In the wintertime, now you thought, oh, well, the holidays, sweets, yada, yada. Well, maybe a little bit of that. But some of it is just the impact of light deprivation in the winter. And the final thing is we find in the population, on average, people's mental acuity drops in the winter. The average person's, if you measure their memory span, if you measure their attention, if you measure their speed of processing, it drops a little bit in the winter. There's a, just a little haze of brain fog that accompanies chronic seasonal light deprivation. And so if we use a light box any time of year, but especially in the winter, we will actually get, it's almost like a little bit of a stimulant drug. 
light therapy actually activates some of the dopamine circuits that are activated when somebody takes Ritalin or Adderall or Vyvanse. It actually has a type of stimulant effect which can increase mental clarity and focus and it actually is a a performance enhancing drug and i think that that's so <laughs> now why did i save the best for last i don't know uh, but, but, <laughs> i actually already see the tiktok title in my head you know light as a performance enhancing drug i'm like bro yeah i know <laughs> but it is okay what, what else we got awesome you have I huge have hacks right yeah, you know, we're bringing it back. This is, I think, the second time, the second time this little segment's making an appearance. So this is basically a segment where I'm going to give my little quick, like, bullet points as someone who's been implementing this stuff for, say, the last two or three years. And these are kind of the things that I found have worked really well for me. Hopefully, they're actionable. Hopefully, you can hear them and apply them to your own life. And the first one is, Steve's already stole it from me. Oh. It's get a, get a travel light box. So, you know, as I said earlier, you know, my wife's from Germany and we spend a good bit of time over there. And it's really, really amazing that I have a travel life, light box because I can just throw it in the hand luggage, get on the plane, shoot over there. And I still get my daily light therapy no matter what, you know, like the light box is one of my absolute non-negotiables. It's my it's one of my essential practices that I do every single day. And one of the ways that I'm able to continue to do that is because I've got a travel box, but also because over the last few years, I've been putting my pennies together and I've been buying one or two extra light boxes to have in different places. So I've got one in my recording studio in Belfast in the city. I've got one at home where I live in the village in Ireland. And I now have one that lives in Germany. And that's really, really helpful for me because, you know, especially when you are having a depressive episode, you're not feeling 100%, you're not on your A game. Something like, oh, my light box is in that room over there <laughs> can be just, just enough, enough yeah. to make you not actually do it. So, you know, if you have one where you're guaranteed to be all the time, say at your kitchen table, and one in a place where you're either working or you're hanging out, it's obviously a little bit extra money up front as an investment, but it's paid off severe dividends for me because it means that I actually do the things that keep me healthy. The other way that I found that is really forces you into keeping the practice as such is, I mean, we talk about habit stacking a lot on the show, but you know, the idea is you don't just sit there and meditate with your eyes open while looking at the light box, unless that's what you're into combine it with another habit steve mentioned putting it in the bathroom and, and you know using it while you do your hair and makeup or you know do your super elite uh, clean shaving routine that you do with a little badger brush and all you know the cutthroat blade whatever it is that you do like find a way to make it work for me i use my light box in the morning and i use it as a guaranteed time that i get a bit of writing in in the morning so whether that is like a journal in practice or working on the novel it's just handy because it, it forces me to write and it forces me to do my light. So the two habits are best friends and they work together uh, to help me do two things that are really, really important to me. One of the things that I would say as well is, and this is a little bit, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of research on this, but the good professor here actually turned me onto this. And it's if you live in a part of the world like I do, where the mornings can be extremely dark for a long time, you know, summer's great now because it's it's eternal light but you know in the winter time here it's common that the sun wouldn't really come up until nine o'clock sometimes which is br brutal i actually worked a job before where I, I did these like 16 hour shifts and i remember like driving in in the pitch black driving being home, inside yeah. all day driving home in the pitch black and that is just it takes a toll oh, bro yeah the bro that is that is not <laughs> the ideal camping trip with your we best do not friends recommend that this. uh yeah, that we were designed for. So, yeah, a dawn simulator alarm clock is basically an alarm clock with a little light component to it. Wait, just let's say that again, just to, just to make sure people got that. Dawn sim. Do it. Oh, dawn, D A W N, dawn simulator. Oh, was it the accent? Are you doing a little accent? I, you know, tweak I, here? I, I, dawn. <laughs> or you know, if you're from from New York, dawn. Uh, <laughs> go on. You're, you're. So, you know, I, l look, let me rejig it, okay? Let me remix okay. it. Okay. A sunrise simulator. Yes. That's probably yes. nicer, actually. A sunrise. Because it simulates the sunrise. Does. You know, so your alarm, say I set my alarm for six. I'm a six o'clock kind of guy. Look, 
we're all different. Steve has a slightly later rhythm than I do. You find yourself somewhere in between the two of us, no doubt. So say your 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 goal wake up time is six o'clock. This little beautiful sunrise simulator will start to get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Say 30 minutes, 15 minutes before you wake up to the point where it wakes you up naturally by light. And you get that amazing for me summer feeling where you're waking up before your alarm. The horns aren't blaring in your face. You can even set it to have like these little birds chirping to wake you up if you don't get woken up naturally by the light. And I have to say, like, I'm a big willpower guy and I'm very, very disciplined. See just that one little change. It just takes, like, it saves me about 10% willpower every single day. Because you just wake up and you're not forcing anything. You're just like, ah, let's go. Time to go and do the first thing in my And it's, it's such a beautiful use of technology to simulate, uh, yeah. to simulate that, that lifelong camping trip of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, by the way, one last thing with that. People with bipolar disorder tend to be extremely sensitive to light, as we mentioned before. But this is a tool that, based on all evidence I've seen, both published research and anecdotally with, with bipolar, they do great. with, And they often, if somebody with bipolar illness is having to get up to their alarm in the dark, this sunrise simulator lamp can be absolutely life-changing. And they're not that expensive. Philips is, and again, we, we have no financial ties with any of these companies. We don't take any endorsements. Big but, screwdriver doesn't sponsor but no, us. But, <laughs> oh, not, yeah, nice touch with Philips. It, Did you like yeah, that? Come screw, on, come on. Yeah, I, you know, the, <laughs> there are some jokes that could flow from it. They're not going to happen. Philips makes a phenomenal Dawn simulator, a whole line of them, but they, you know, like 60, 80 bucks. I mean, again, I know for some people that, that that's going to be a real investment. Can I just jump yeah. in with a, a, a bonus Hugh life hack? Secondhand. People oh, are always yeah. flogging their light boxes and their sunrise simulator secondhand. Thank you. And it is it is 30% RRP. It's 30% retail price. Yeah, so nice. There you go. Nice. You're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's great. <laughs> okay. Okay. Last thing. Last little cue hack here. We play this game in my house. Actually, we play this game in this country that we live in. I don't think it has an official name. For today's purposes, we're going to call it the sunlight game. And it's basically anytime the sun is out and anytime the sun is shining, even on a particular little corner of your garden, you go and you try to be in that uh, ray of light. And so it's interesting, like once you start to really, really think about light intentionally and trying to get this light, you know, you'll find yourself, I was sitting at the kitchen table the other day with my daughter having breakfast and I noticed the sun was shining through the window on us and I just opened the window as max as it could go so that the sun was coming in and hitting us in the face without going through the glass. And like, I do it all the time now. Like I actually use Eliana's high chair as like a outdoor desk. And any time that it's sunny, I just literally grab the high chair, put the laptop on top of it and continue my laptop work if there's a little bit of sun hitting me. So obviously this is in an Irish context. If you're in a place where the sun's shining all the time, you want to be very, very careful. I would say our yeah. sun cream. <laughs> you want to be very, very careful with your skin cancer, all that sort of stuff. But if you're in a place where you don't have a lot of sun, it can be kind of fun to start and uh, see how much light you can get. You know, we're in the park in the mornings and we're always looking for like, okay, we're going to go on the swings for the first part of it because the sun is there already. And if we wait 20 minutes, then we're going to get the, the sun on the trampoline bit and all this sort of stuff. But like, you get the idea. Go for the light, protect your skin, but it's super fun and it's super good for you. And you get the added bonus of a little bit of vitamin D, which I'm sure we'll do an episode on down we the line of some of the therapy yeah. effects of that. But that's what we like to call the two birds with the one stone. Nice call out. Yeah. Um, one last thing I, I one last thing that I wanted to add. <laughs> for those of us who are in a pretty healthy space, if you're you know doing pretty well right now, but you want to be living your best life, if you can build in the habit of just getting outside, as long as you can dress appropriately for it, any time of year, get outside when the sun is up for just 15 minutes in the morning. That 15 minutes outside, even if it's cloudy, even if it's overcast, it doesn't matter it's going to be way, way, way brighter than indoors. And it is going to dramatically improve the quality of your sleep that night. 
it's going to make it easier to fall asleep. It'll also give you more of the restorative deep, slow wave sleep. There's a very strong connection between the amount of bright light we get in the daytime and the depth of sleep, that deep, slow wave sleep at night. So it's all bonus. If you want to do my own habit stack that I love to do is, is to go for a walk first thing in the morning, at least, you know, as long as the sun's up and, you know, just getting out and walking the dog or just walking yourself, going with your partner, a friend, whoever, a po- oh, podcast. Hey, <laughs> I know this is a habit stack I can get behind. Um, <laughs> listen to your favorite podcast while you're out for, a, and you know, the, the way I'm yammering on today, you could, at 15 minutes a clip, you could like get a whole week's worth practically out of one episode. <laughs> anyway, this is a habit, just getting outside mm. 15 minutes in the morning will absolutely change the quality of your life for the better in innumerable ways. So it's it's just such a simple little simple little tweak, but uh, the dividends are, are uh, pretty incredible. Absolutely, yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I, um, oh no, I'll do that a bit later. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've, I've been making a few notes here that I wanna share with you, but I'll do it after the outro. So here's the outro guys. We're being very on the nose here this whole episode. Welcome to the deep structure of this podcast interview that has been meticulously planned. Every single bullet point, every single rabbit hole we meant to say. This is now the <laughs> outro segment. Are you preparing yourself? If you're out for a walk, I suggest you turn around so you can make it back to your house in time before the episode ends. Or maybe right. just find like a, a boulder or a stump to sit on <laughs> so you can be fully immersed in in, uh, in the nuggets of wisdom that are about to, to, to flow from our own huge James. Look, it's the it's the regular nuggets here, okay? We really appreciate you listening. Honestly, like really, really, we're so grateful that you chose to spend this time with us. As always, we really hope it was beneficial to you. Light therapy is something that has made a huge impact on my life. And I hope that as you start to implement some of these things or optimize or upscale or tweak your kind of current light practice, that the benefits will be really massive and will kind of play a domino effect into some of the other aspects of your mental health toolkit which is the series that we are doing at the minute. You can go back and check out our episode on Omega-3 that we did last week. If you're new to the show, I highly recommend going through the back catalog on Spotify or YouTube and diving into you know our one-on-one episodes. If you struggle with a specific disorder or is there someone that you love that struggles with a specific disorder, so far we've done depression, anxiety, addiction, and ADHD. More of them to come. We already kind of teased Bipolar 101, which I'm very, very excited to do. Absolutely. That's coming. Other than that, we just want to say you can reach out to us and say hello via our website, which is mentalhealth.fm. And as always, you can support us on Patreon. Uh, The link will be in the description of this episode. It's on our website. You can also just look for Mental Health Podcast on Patreon. You can find us that way. And this show, literally, it is supported by our Patreon community. We would not be able to do it without you guys. You are the people that keep the lights oh, on. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You know what? That was actually uncontrollable because it just happened. And I realized it was happening, but my self-control wasn't fast enough to stop me from uh, doing it. It was literally compulsive. Is this how you know you're a dad? It, is that how it works? Yeah, the uncontrollable wow. impulse to drop the dad jokes in the wow. flow of everyday life. Oh. And it's outside of your conscious control. It's, yeah, I, I could not have stopped if I wanted to. It's an affliction. And I'd love to say that professional help is available, but I'm, <laughs> we're, we're working on it, is, is all I can say. <laughs> Yeah, we're flawed humans here, you know. But yeah, look, we're a crowdfunded show. We don't rely on sponsorship. We don't rely on any sort of financial strings attached to this. We are on a mission to reach and share this sort of content with over 1 million people around the world. And we Wait, are did you are you speaking that into be... existence? 1 million people? Yeah, it, it, yeah, like I was thinking about this the other day actually like to do a little like TLDR, I was looking at an old like values document I'd made years ago. That's like such a uh, huge yeah, thing. Yeah, it do, really, really is. I think it was listeners like, are like, what the hell is a values? Yeah, okay. I think it was like a picture kind of like life goals sort there of thing. Okay. And I was just it was just before we started off in in this journey. I think it was just after we had met. And one of the reasons why I was so excited about meeting you is because just before our first Zoom, like way back when, like two years ago during the pandemic, I remember writing down this thing where I was like 
it, you know, I kind of had completed a hero's journey with Ireland and a project I was involved in there. And I was like, what's next? And I was like, do you know what? I would love to reach a million people who are struggling with mental health issues and give them something. Like, even if it's just something small that they can start deploying. But because I remember what it, what it was like to be there and that like complete isolated, lonely feeling. And you feel like there was no help available. There was no information that you could use. And so... You know, whether it was a podcast episode or a blog post, or I don't even know what I had in my head at that stage, but I was like, you know, how awesome would it be? You couldn't necessarily measure it, but if you somehow were able to to reach a million hues, if that makes sense, who were in that situation. And so, yeah, like big thanks to the Patreon community because you you basically make that happen. So thank you. Absolutely. We we could not do this without each one of you. And, and I, you know, and I want you all to know, we feel like our mission is just to be here for whoever could benefit from this. If, if it's a hundred people, if it's a thousand people, if it's a million people, it doesn't, doesn't ultimately matter. And, and I've always felt that way. You know, when I'm doing psychotherapy, I'm sitting across from one person. And I think, Ga- was it Gandhi who said, you know, the, the entire universe is contained in each of us. I mean, if, 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 we, can, if we can have an impact on one life for the better, then you know, we're fulfilled. So I, there's a, a tricky little dialectic there and we're not going to get too philosophical, but, <laughs> but but our mission is to be here for, for each of you and to offer what we can. And, and that's a very humbling thing, really, to think about, like, you know, we, in our respective journeys, each of us have learned some things that have changed our lives for the better and that we get to pass on. And so it's a privilege, it's a joy. And I don't know if you can tell, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, so <laughs> Probably too much fun uh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, listen, I, many, many, of our, uh, many of our viewers and, and listeners have commented on the, the needle that we're threading where we're dealing with some really difficult content, right? I mean, whenever you're talking about human suffering, that that requires a certain level of fortitude. And yet, to be able to thread the needle and to go to these dark places with humor, with appropriate humor, with, you know, with a sense of, like, there is a joy in this journey even if it means going to some some really tough places, because the joy is in seeing that that suffering doesn't have to be forever. And Hugh and I both in different ways in our journeys have been at that place of psychological pain and to be in a place of well-being and joy and now to have this incredible journey of being able to help other people. That's what we're about. So, if you know, in a nutshell, you'll probably hear that from us lots every time every, yeah. <laughs> but that's what drives us so thank you all so much for being part of this hugh thank you for indulging <laughs> my, my little riff there at the end well w- would you like a little silly indulgent at the end yes. of the notes i've been yes. taking okay right okay so maybe this is going to be a repeating theme maybe this is going to be something to do once but sometimes some of the things you say i'm like whoa this could be repurposed into something else so the theme for this episode was if we were to start a band, okay? <laughs> so if we were to start a band, we would be called the Zeitgebers. Oh, the Zeitgebers, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Our first album would be called 10,000 Lux From Above. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, uh, I like it better our... than 10,000 Maniacs, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the two songs that I kind of wrote down as we went was Don't Stare Into The Light, Brackets Box, and then the last one was called The Darkness Hormone. <laughs> I'm, I'm digging it. Well, and then we could do do a cover of, uh, of, of Springsteen's Blinded by the Light. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think Man, awesome. Manfred Mann also covered that. So, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thanks, my friend. See you later. Be well.